So what we're going to talk about today is the first half of chapter 5. This is going to be pages 171 to 179. We'll be talking about DNA and chromosomes today, and more specifically, we'll be talking first about the structure of DNA, and we'll include in that a discussion of hydrogen bonds themselves. Move on to the function of DNA, and we'll end with the Oswald-Avery experiment, uh, which should really start or end any discussion of DNA. So DNA has a lot of responsibility for life. It actually carries a very he heavy burden. First, it must carry all of the information needed to make a single organism survive, to make that organism live, to allow that organism to reproduce. But also DNA must be intrinsically replicatable, if that's even a word. What we mean by that is that DNA has to contain within itself the ability to be copied, to make two identical DNA molecules from one. That information needs to be in the DNA molecule itself. Now we can imagine a lot of everyday objects that we encounter that contain information. A book is a perfect example. A book is an information containing object, so that's fairly easy to wrap our minds around. However, this idea of being self-replicating is a little bit more abstract. Here's a diagram of a self-replicating machine. This would be a machine that builds a new copy of itself from spare parts. So you can see this machine is shown here. And what is it doing? It's building another machine just like it. And that machine is building a third machine like itself. Uh, also, this drawing by M.C. Escher shows self-replication. I uh, invite you to stare at this for a while and see if you get as nauseous by it as I do. But these are self-replicating objects, things that copy themselves intrinsically. Now remember, DNA has to be a molecule that is self-replicating and information-containing. It has to have the properties that we find in things like books, but also contain the information within itself to be copied identically. I think we would all be hard-pressed to come up with an everyday example of a molecule or of a thing, an object that can do both of these things. So really, before we knew what DNA was, this was the very first question that was faced by molecular biology. It was known that the inheritable material of life had to contain information and be replicatable. So heritable material had to contain information and be self-replicating. But what on earth could do this? And the answer, of course, is DNA does this. And really the basis, the uh, point of today's lecture is to study and learn how that's possible. So when it comes to DNA and these processes of being replicatable and containing information, we use special terms in biology. The ability of a cell or of a genome of any DNA molecule to replicate itself to be copied is called mitosis. And the central dogma of molecular biology explains how DNA contains information, specifically how that information contained in DNA manifests. And, and usually the information contained in DNA is used to make proteins. And as any of you who have had me in class before know, I love to say that proteins do everything, and they do. Proteins do everything in a cell. We'll come back to that in just a second. Also, for those of you who had me last semester in genetics, the concepts of mitosis and the central dogma should be familiar with uh, emphasis on should. For those of you who didn't have me for genetics, I hope these are familiar topics to you as well. We won't go into them too much in detail today, and uh, I expect you guys to have some idea of what mitosis and the central dogma are. What we don't have the time to cover in genetics is the chemical nature of DNA. We don't really get to talk about DNA as a molecule, as a biomolecule itself. More specifically, DNA as a set of atoms. Now, we won't go into any real chemistry today, but we will talk about the molecule, the physical molecule of DNA, and how that structure allows DNA to do what it does. DNA is the molecule of life for all life on Earth. There is no living cell on this planet that uses anything but DNA to hold its information and to be replicatable. But it is the chemistry and structure of DNA that gives it both of these properties. And so let's talk about the structure of DNA. In the 1800s, microscopes got powerful enough that they allowed early scientists to kind of look in and see living cells divide. And this basically shows what those scientists saw. They saw that when cells went from a non-dividing state to a dividing state, those cells went to a whole lot of trouble to make sure that each new daughter cell that was made got a complete set of this stuff here. We see here. 
Uh, these are two identical copies of stuff that this original cell went to a whole lot of trouble to make sure each new daughter cell got. We know this process as mitosis, and we now know that these stages of mitosis are, are broken down by uh, what occurs in those stages. We also know that these things that these daughter cells are getting are chromosomes. These were initially named chromosomes because they were easily stained with exi existing dyes at the time. So chromosomes literally translates to things that color. And the scientists who were watching this happen correctly surmised that whatever these chromosomes were, they must be important to the cell. More specifically, they must contain the heterable material of life because why else would these cells go to so much trouble to make sure that new daughter cells got a complete set? Now, certainly there was nothing else in the cell that was paid attention to as much as these chromosomes were. Then in the early 1900s, technology got a little bit better, and it was discovered then that these chromosomes were made up of two primary components, DNA and protein. The shape and structure of the DNA molecule was still not known at this time. Watson and Crick had not done their hallmark experiments. But it was known that DNA contained only four different building blocks, and those building blocks were cytosine, guanine, adenosine, and thymine. Scientists around that time, being their typical open-minded selves, and I hope that my sarcasm comes through on that, quickly dismissed DNA as being important because those scientists came to the conclusion that it was simply too simple. That DNA molecule, uh, being made up of only four things, was too simple a structure to contain all of the information of life. The prevailing belief at that time was that it must be the proteins that were found in chromosomes that contained the heterable material of life. And the purpose of DNA was simply structural. DNA was thought to be a scaffolding that was there to hold these different proteins together. We now know that the opposite is true. The proteins that you find in chromosomes are actually just structural. They're packaging materials allowing the DNA to condense up. We'll talk about that in our next lecture. What I find amusing is that these scientists in their rush, rush to judgment and being closed-minded forgot very simple principles such as the English alphabet, music, Morse code. Uh, they forgot science in general. The English alphabet is a set of 26 characters. And from those 26 characters, we make all of the words that we know of in the English language. I'm not much of a mu musician, but I think there's something like 10 notes in music. And from those notes at their different pitches, uh, we make all of the music and all of the songs that we know of in human existence. Morse code is a series of dashes and dots, or long tones and beeps, that are brought together to symbolize every single letter in the English alphabet, and then in turn, to make all of the words that we know of. And DNA, then, is nothing more than an alphabet of four letters. And those letters come together to make molecular words, molecular phrases. What's important in all of these examples, and what those scientists in the early 1900s forgot, was that it's the sequence that matters. It is the sequence of letters that gives language its meaning. It is the sequence of the notes that give music its musicality. It is the sequence of dashes and dots that give Morse code its meaning, and it is the sequence contained in DNA of these four molecules that hold meaning in that molecule. And so, once DNA gained a little bit of steam and people started realizing that DNA did hold information, and we'll come back to that at the end of the lecture, that's the Avery experiment that I alluded to in the first slide. In the, in the 1950s, Scientists, including Watson and Crick, but not exclusively them, discovered the structure of DNA, and they realized that DNA was a double helix. I'm sure you're all familiar with this general model of DNA, but DNA is made up of two strands. In those strands are the bases of DNA, the cytosines, the guanines, the adenines, and the thymines, the Gs, Cs, As, and Ts, and those strands kind of wrap around themselves to form a helix. By understanding the structure of DNA, we can learn and understand how DNA has both of the properties that we've already talked about, how it can contain information, and how it can be self-replicating.
like much of the molecules of life, it is actually DNA's structure that gives it its function. This structure of DNA that you see here allows it to contain information and be self-replicating. However, to understand that structure of DNA, the first thing we need to have a good understanding of is hydrogen bonds. These, these red lines that you see connecting these bases together, these symbolize hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds are what hold the two strands of DNA together. So let's briefly talk about hydrogen bonds, just to make sure that we all understand what they are. In general, hydrogen bonds are bonds that exist between any two polar molecules, one of those molecules serving as a hydrogen bond donor and the other serving as a hydrogen bond acceptor. The best example of a polar molecule that can participate in hydrogen bonds is just plain water. And so rather than use complicated DNA as our example, let's talk about water first. So water is a polar molecule, and what we mean by that is that water has an unequal charge distribution. Said more simply, one side of water is just a little bit negative, and the other side of water is just a little bit positive. So, like this, here's a molecule that's positive on one side and negative on the other. But no, this isn't a good example, because I said a bit negative and a bit positive, and these are full ionic charges. This is a full positive charge and a full negative charge. So, how can something be a bit charged? And the answer to that question is through the property of electronegativity. So here's water. We all know water is H2O, two hydrogens and an oxygen. And oxygen is electronegative. Electronegative atoms exert a strong attractive force for electrons, specifically for the electrons in covalent bonds that those atoms share with other things. So here, oxygen has a covalent bond with these two hydrogens. And remember, covalent bonds are nothing more than shared electrons. But oxygen is electronegative. So oxygen exerts a strong attractive force for these electrons in these bonds. If oxygen is acting as a magnet for these electrons and electrons are negatively charged, what do you think kind of charge will be around the oxygen? that charge will be negative. These negatively charged electrons will be drawn towards the oxygen. They'll spend more time around the oxygen, giving oxygen a slight negative charge. That's our bit right there, not a full negative charge, but slightly negative. Now, these electrons were supposed to be equally shared between oxygen and hydrogen, but they're being pulled towards oxygen more. Another way of saying that is they're being deprived from hydrogen. So what's going to be the charge around hydrogen now that it is deficient of these electrons? Partially positive. Not fully positive, but partially positive, representing that electron deficit. This is why we call water a polar molecule. It has polarity. It has different sides. A partially negative side and a partially positive side. It's important to note that nitrogen is also electronegative. So nitrogen behaves like oxygen in this way, drawing electrons towards it. Now I'd like you to think about this. What's going to happen if another water molecule floats by? And it floats by in this orientation. Now remember, this is another water molecule, identical to the first. And so it's also going to have a partial negative charge around this oxygen. What's going to happen is that opposites attract. This partial negative charge on this oxygen is going to be attracted to this partial positive charge on this hydrogen. This attraction is a hydrogen bond. It is nothing more than a partial negative charge interacting with a partial positive charge between a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor. It is this property and this property alone that gives water surface tension. The reason why this paper cl paper clip can float on this water is not because the paper clip is light. It is because the water is so attracted to itself. The water is engaged in so many hydrogen bonds with other water molecules that they do not want to allow this paper clip to pass through to break those bonds. This is why water droplets can form and dangle there and quiver so large, appearing to defy gravity because the water is happy interacting with other water molecules. There is surface tension made up of nothing but hydrogen bonds.
So a hydrogen bond is a weak, non-covalent bond between a partially positive hydrogen bond, hydrogen, excuse me, that's our donor, and a partially negative, electronegative atom, such as nitrogen or oxygen. Both of these interacting with each other creates the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are responsible for much of life. They allow proteins to interact with each other. They allow enzymes to function. And why we got into this discussion in the first place, they hold the two strands of DNA together as well. Before we leave this discussion of hydrogen bonds, it's important for you to know that there are many molecules out there that are nonpolar. Carbon dioxide is a perfect example. Carbon is not electronegative. It does not draw electrons towards it. Carbon dioxide has no polarity, no partial charges, no full charges, and so it is nonpolar. Carbon dioxide will not engage in any hydrogen bonds. These nonpolar molecules, such as carbon dioxide, have no charge characteristics of any kind. So let's go back to DNA now. Hydrogen bonds are what hold your two strands of DNA together in a double helix. The only thing holding these two strands together here are hydrogen bonds. The only thing holding these two strands together here are weak, non-covalent bonds. I always think that's kind of freaky. I just kind of want to crawl under the sheets and hope that my DNA doesn't fall apart. But why does this work? Why can such a weak bond hold something as critical as DNA together? The answer to that question is Velcro. See, the way Velcro works is that there are very, very, very small hooks on one side of Velcro and very, very, very fine loops made out of thread on the other side of Velcro. And you get a closer look at Velcro, this is what you see. Here in white, you see the very, very fine thread making up the loops, and here in red are the hooks. Now, an individual Velcro interaction is extremely weak. You have a very small hook interacting with a very thin thread, just like an individual hydrogen bond is very, very weak. But what happens when you put together a lot of hooks and loops? You get a very, very tight interaction between one Velcro strip and the other. The same thing happens with hydrogen bonds. If you get enough hydrogen bonds together, if you have lots and lots of weak interactions, you have the sum total of a very strong interaction, if there are sufficient weak interactions there. This idea of many, many, many weak interactions is what holds Velcro together. Many, many weak hydrogen bonds hold DNA together. Now moving on. Each individual strand of DNA, so now we separate the two strands, we're not talking about hydrogen bonds anymore, each individual single strand of DNA is nothing more than a chain of nucleotides. And these nucleotides are held together by covalent bonds, by true electron-sharing bonds. So here in this diagram we see our standard double helix of DNA. And this is actually two strands of DNA wrapped around each other. Hydrogen bonds are holding the bases together in the center, but we can pull these two strands apart and look at just one strand. And this one strand of DNA is nothing more than a chain of nucleotides held together by covalent bonds. These nucleotides are the alphabet of DNA. They are the cytosines, the guanines, the adenines, and the thymines. So what is a nucleotide? Well, a single nucleotide consists of three parts. There's a ribose sugar, a phosphate group or phosphate groups, and the DNA base itself. So here we're looking at the base adenine. That is the molecular language of DNA. That is the alphabet letter of DNA, adenine. But the nucleotide actually consists of adenine hooked to a ribose sugar, which is also hooked to phosphate groups. Now it's also important to tell you that I'm showing you a mistake right here. This is actually the adenine that's found in RNA, ribonucleic acid. DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid. And the reason why it's called deoxyribonucleic acid is because it has been deoxified. If you look down here at the hydroxyl group, you'll see that in DNA, this hydroxyl group is actually a simple hydrogen. That is why DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid, because it is missing that oxygen right here. In any event, this is the A of DNA. This is the A nucleotide. It contains the base, 
the ribose and the phosphates. If we remove that adenine base, we can pop on any of these other bases right here. We can put on a guanine, and then we would have the guanine nucleotide. We could put cytosine right here, and we would have the cytosine nucleotide. We could take thymine and hook it on right here, and we would have the thymine nucleotide. What's important from this is that the nucleotide, I'm sorry, that the bases themselves, the adenine, the guanine, the thymine, and the cytosine, are the information containing portions of the nucleotide. The sugar and the phosphate are just structural. These sugar phosphates make up the backbone of DNA. If you think of DNA as a spiral staircase, they would make up the banisters. And they are repeating. And so you see here it's phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. No information there all structural, holding these ribbons of DNA together, and because these phosphates are negatively charged, this backbone of DNA is itself negatively charged. This is why DNA is a negatively charged molecule. The bases of the DNA, the guanines, the cytosines, the thymines, and the adenines, they point inward, away from the backbone. And again, using that analogy of a spiral staircase, it is the bases that make up the steps of that staircase. If we go from this kind of straight chain model to more of an accurate helical model, we again see the phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar backbone negatively charged. And in between those two backbones are the steps, the bases of the DNA itself. These are the A's, the T's, the G's, and the C's, and these are what contain the information of DNA. Now we just finished talking about hydrogen bonds, but please note that here we see holding these two bases together, holding one strand of DNA to the other, are our hydrogen bonds. So many of you along the way have probably heard that DNA goes from 5' prime to 3', prime, and many of you probably have no idea what we mean by that. Let's put some understanding to that idea by getting a little bit of a different look at a nucleotide. So here we're seeing a nucleotide as well, but we've kind of stripped away the base, so we don't see the big bulky adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine here. We've just replaced it with this little marker. And so what we are looking at is the ribose sugar and one single phosphate coming off of that sugar. Now chemists like to number things. I'm not really sure why chemists like to number things, but they do. And they like to number carbons in molecules such as this. It makes some sense. If you're going to number something, you should number the carbons, because carbons are usually the most critical atom in a molecule, especially for biomolecules or organic molecules. The carbons are what are important. So chemists like to number the carbons. The carbons in the base itself get normal numbers. Now, we don't see that here, but all of the carbons in the base, whether it's an A, a G, a C, or a T, they get normal numbers. To distinguish those carbons from the carbons on the ribose sugar, the ribose sugar carbons get primed. What I mean by that is this carbon right here on the ribose sugar is called the one prime carbon. This is the two prime carbon, the three prime carbon, the four prime carbon, and the five prime carbon. Now nucleotides are linked together through that phosphate sugar backbone. And more specifically, they are linked together from their top that's this phosphate group right here, which comes off the 5' prime carbon through to their bottom, the bottom of the previous nucleotide, to be more specific. More specifically still, the hydroxyl group coming off of that 3' prime carbon. So let's get a closer look at that. Here we have a nucleotide that we've just added to this growing chain of DNA. And look how that nucleotide is attached. It is attached to this 3' prime hydroxyl of the first nucleotide through the phosphate coming off of the 5' prime carbon of the second nucleotide. The direction of this DNA goes from its top 5' prime to its bottom 3' prime to the top of the next 5' prime to its bottom 3'. prime. If we wanted to add another nucleotide to this chain, we would attach the hydroxyl group that we would find right here to the phosphate group of the next nucleotide, taking that 5' prime top and linking it to this 3' prime bottom. So in this way, DNA actually has a molecular beginning and end. The beginning of a DNA strand is its 5' prime end. That's its top. And the end 
of the DNA strand is the 3 prime hydroxyl of the very last nucleotide on the chain. This molecular characteristic of having direction, of having a beginning and an end, is called polarity. And by convention's sake, we always call the beginning of a DNA molecule its 5 prime end, and we always call the end of that molecule its 3 prime end. So we've talked about hydrogen bonds, and we've talked about single strands of nucleotides linked together to make a ribbon of DNA. Now let's bring all of this together and make for ourselves a double-stranded molecule of DNA, of deoxyribonucleic acid. We have our single strands of molecules. They are chains of individual nucleotides linked together through their phosphates at the 5' prime carbon and their hydroxyls at the 3' prime carbon, giving us a 5' prime to 3' prime chain of nucleotides linked together through a phosphate sugar backbone. That's shown more specifically here. Again, not to beat a dead horse, but so everybody understands, we have a repeating non-informational backbone of DNA that is just phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, negatively charged. Pointing away from that are our bases that can be thymine, adenine, cytosine, or guanine in any sequence that is needed to contain the information of that molecule. Just like language and music, it is the sequence of these bases that carry information. However, these bases can engage in hydrogen bonds, and they can pair up with one another between two different strands of DNA through those hydrogen bonds. Specifically, adenine can base pair with thymine, and only with thymine, and it does so through two hydrogen bonds. Guanine can base pair with cytosine, and only with cytosine, and it does so through three hydrogen bonds. These are the rules of DNA base pairing. A's base pair with T's, T's with A's, G's base pair with C's, and C's with G's. Therefore, one strand of DNA can easily base pair with another strand as long as those two sequences on both of those strands are what we call complementary. Complementary bases come together and base pair allowing two individual ribbons of DNA to come together and form a double-stranded, double-helix DNA molecule. That's shown as a double helix here, and that's shown a little bit more linearly here. We see again the backbone of DNA, the bases of DNA facing inward, the complementary strand of DNA here with its backbone, those bases point, pointing inward, making up the stairs of the spiral staircase, and we see the rules of base pairing are maintained. Adenine with thymine, cytosine with guanine, thymine with adenine, guanine with cytosine. Notice that the bulky purines are always paired with the smaller pyrimidines. Adenine and guanine are the purines. The purines are the larger ring structure. They're made up of a double ring here. Pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine. Cytosine and thymine are the single ring structures that you see here. And we always get a purine paired with a pyrimidine. The reason for this is it keeps the diameter of DNA uniform. If you imagine two purine space pairing, you would see that would take up a lot of room and bulge the DNA molecule out. If pyrimidines were allowed to base pair with one another, that would be a much more narrow base pairing. It would pinch the DNA backbone in. By keeping purines base pairing with pyrimidines only, the diameter of DNA becomes uniform despite the differences in sequences that we see in DNA molecules. In fact, if you were to take this molecule of DNA, or any molecule of DNA that's going up and down here, pull it out of the screen, and rotate it towards you so that you were looking down through the top, you would see this remarkably beautiful structure. This is DNA looking down on it in cross-section from the top down. And you can see the symmetry of this molecule, the repeating nature of this molecule, the beauty of this molecule. This is because, for one reason at least, pyrimidines exclusively being base paired with purines, keeping that diameter of DNA uniform, keeping that structure repeating.
Some other points on DNA. The two strands are always anti-parallel. What we mean by that is if one strand is going from 5 prime to 3 prime top to bottom, the other will always be going 5 prime to 3 prime bottom to top. They are always going in opposite directions, like a double lane road and two directions of traffic going in opposite ways. Okay, so maybe now, as we kind of look back on what we've talked about with DNA, we have a little bit of sympathy for those early scientists who scoffed at DNA as the molecule of life. Maybe not much sympathy. You should always keep an open mind if you're a scientist. But DNA is very repeating. It's very, very uniform. And it is, for the most part, molecularly simple, if that's a word. So maybe we understand them saying, how could it possibly be that a molecule such as this holds all of the information for all life on this planet? To come full circle from some of the things we talked about earlier on in the lecture, it's proteins that really make life possible. It's proteins that catalyze biochemical reactions, allowing those reactions to occur. It's proteins that hold cells and tissues and organisms together structurally. It's proteins that move everything around in cells and allow cellular trafficking to occur. It's proteins that send, receive, and truly are the messages of the cell. Proteins do everything. Proteins do everything. They do everything. Cells are alive solely because of the action of proteins. And DNA's job is to simply contain the instructions for building all of those proteins. So DNA is the blueprints of life because DNA is the blueprints for building proteins. And proteins make life possible. Proteins, at their simplest, most fundamental structure, are nothing more than chains themselves. Proteins are chains of building blocks called amino acids. DNA is chains of building blocks called nucleotides. But proteins are sequences of amino acids. And the alphabet of proteins has 20 characters. That means that there are 20 different amino acids that are stuck together in chains to make all of the proteins that we know in all of life. Now, the same principles apply that we talked about for the English alphabet. How is it possible that you make all these different proteins in all of these different cells with nothing more than 20 amino acids? Well, ask yourself, how do you make all of the different words of the English language using nothing more than 26 letters? It's the sequence. It's the sequence of the amino acids that make the protein be what it is. So, DNA genes are nothing more than an encrypted code that contains the instructions for building proteins. See, DNA uses a different alphabet. DNA uses an alphabet of four. Proteins use an alphabet of 20. But there is a translation there. The information in that DNA alphabet of four has in it what is needed to make proteins. As an example or an analogy here, let's consider uh, courtroom stenographers. These are the people who type silently right in front of the judge as courtroom proceedings are going on. And their job is to record everything that everyone says during a court case. This is the stenographer's keyboard. Now take a look at this keyboard. I don't see a C. I don't see an X. I don't see an M. I don't see an N. This is the output of a stenographer's recordings. And what this sheet here says is, this is an example of a machine shorthand form, a steno keyboard with paper. This language from this alphabet can be converted into this language using this alphabet. The language of DNA is a nucleotide language. It consists, consists of a different alphabet. But in the sequence of that alphabet, you can create the translation to the language of amino acids and proteins. So the nucleotide sequence of a DNA gene made up of nothing but C's and A's and T's and G's, if I said that right, can be and is translated by the cell 
into a sequence of amino acids. You just need to know the translation. And this is the translation. This is the DNA to protein dictionary that you're looking at here. This is the translation from DNA sequence to amino acid. The way it works is that you need three nucleotides to encode the information for a single amino acid, but that's no problem. We can do that. And so the DNA sequence TTT, thymine, 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 is the instruction to use a phenylalanine amino acid in that place. The DNA sequence cytosine adenine adenine contains the information for putting glutamine in that space. This is how DNA holds the information for building proteins. Two different alphabets can be translated to one another. And the language of DNA can contain the language of amino acids. Now, all life is different from one another on this planet solely because of the differences in our DNA, the differences in our genomes, the differences in our genes. In fact, the only things that make us, you and I, humans, different from bacteria are our DNA. That means the only things that make us different are the proteins we make. To me, that's just an incredible idea, that the only significant difference between us and a bacterial cell is our DNA information, which is nothing more than an instruction manual for building proteins. So we'll leave this lecture with the Avery experiment. Basically proved that DNA was the information containing molecule of life. Before this experiment, we just didn't know what molecule could contain the information needed for life. The reason why we're going over the Avery experiment now is because truly it would be a disservice if I ended this lecture without describing it. This is the quintessential hallmark experiment that proved that DNA was the heritable material of life. In the late 1930s, we, not us, but scientists and people at the time, knew that there must be an inherited molecule of life. Uh, there must be a way to get information from one cell to the next. And indeed, as we already said in the intro, we saw that these chromosomes were being meticulously dealt out to daughter cells, and so it was surmised that chromosomes must be or contain that information. We just didn't know what that molecule was or what that molecule did. Avery and his colleagues figured out in a very elegant way that it was DNA that contained this information. So let's go over that experiment. This is Avery's experiment. There were at the time, and there still are, two strains of the bacterium S. pneumoniae, if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, by looking at that bacteria's name, it's pretty easy to see what illness that causes. Now, one of these strains was strain S, and strain S of this bacterium kills things. It kills people, it kills mice, it, it's infectious. Another strain, strain R, is avirulent, and what that means is that the R strain doesn't cause infection. So, what Avery first showed was that if you boil this virulent, deadly S strain, you would kill the bacteria in there. And those dead bacteria couldn't launch an infection anymore, and so people and animals exposed to dead S strain bacteria lived. There's no big surprise there. So we see that in this diagram. If you take a mouse and you inject it with living S bacteria, the mouse dies from pneumonia. You take a mouse and inject it with living R strain of this bacteria, the mouse lives because the R strain is avirulent. If you take the S deadly bacteria and you boil them, they all die. Inject those into a mouse, the mouse lives because the dead bacteria doesn't hurt the mouse. However, what Avery showed was that if you take those heat-killed, non-deadly S strain bacteria and you mix them with living R strain bacteria, the R cells actually become transformed and they become virulent. Now, let's say that again. You start with dead, uh, dead non-virulent S strain cells that don't kill mice and you mix them with living avirulent R strain cells that don't kill mice. And what you get when you do that is a deadly concoction. 
So in other words, when you mix these two things together and you inject that into a mouse, the mouse dies. So that was definitely a head-scratcher. What Avery realized was that there must be something left from these dead S cells that passed the information on to the R cells for being virulent. In other words, Avery realized that the heritable information of life was left over after these S cells died, passed to the R cells, and that heritable material of life contained the information for virulence. So these living R cells took that information and used it to become virulent themselves and kill that mouse. Avery and his colleagues realized that they must have the information molecule of life in their hands. So what they then did was they painstakingly purified all of the different individual biomolecules from those dead, heat-killed, formerly virulent S cells. And they mixed each of those individual biomolecules with the avirulent R cells and repeated their experiment. So in other words, they heat-killed these S cells, they burst them all open, and they got out just the RNA from them. And they mixed that RNA with R cells, and what happened? The mouse lived. They got just the proteins out of these dead heat-killed S cells. They mixed it with R cells. Mouse lived. They got just the lipids. Mixed it with R cells. Mouse lived. Just the carbs. Just the sugars. Mixed it with R cells. Mouse lived. But then they isolated the DNA and just the DNA from these dead S cells. And they mixed it with R cells. And those R cells became virulent. And they killed that mouse. So lo and behold, the only molecule that could, contra that could transform an R cell into an S cell was DNA itself. That meant DNA contained information. That meant the information in DNA was transferable. That meant that DNA had to be the heterable material of life. This was a happy, happy day for biology. This set the stage for much of what came after it. But unfortunately, thick-headed scientists are hard to convince. Avery's work lay dormant and unrecognized for many, many years. He was old when he did this work, and he died before it was accepted, and so Avery never won the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize cannot be awarded uh, after death. So Avery never received the recognition he deserved for this experiment. So that's all we'll talk about today. To summarize some of the major concepts we did cover, first of all, we said that DNA, if it is the heterable material of life, must have two properties. It must be able to carry all of the information needed to make an organism live, and it must be intrinsically replicatable. We said that DNA is an alphabet, and it's simply an alphabet of four letters. Those letters we now know are nucleotides, and the nucleotides that make up DNA are cytosine, guanine, adenine and thymine. Each individual strand of DNA is just a chain of these nucleotides held together by covalent bonds. And each individual nucleotide is made up of three parts. A ribose sugar, a phosphate backbone, a phosphate group, excuse me, and the DNA base itself. The ribose sugar and the phosphate make up that negatively charged structural backbone of DNA, and the base is what contains the information. DNA is, has polarity. It has a beginning and an end. The polarity of DNA is a 5' prime beginning and a 3' prime end, so DNA goes from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Now, single strands of DNA can come together and base pair with one another, and they do so through non-covalent weak hydrogen bonds. Adenine base pairs with thiamine through two hydrogen bonds. Cytosine base pairs with guanine through three hydrogen bonds. And we went through hydrogen bonds. You're responsible to know how hydrogen bonds work. We talked about what a hydrogen bond is. The two sequences on either strand of base pairing DNA are said to be complementary. That just means that the A's are with the T's and the G's are with the C's. We went on to talk very briefly about how DNA contains the information for building proteins. DNA genes are nothing more than the encrypted codes needed 
to build proteins or sequences of amino acids. It's the proteins that do the work of the cell. It's the proteins that keep the cell alive. Proteins do everything. But DNA, by containing the information for building proteins, thereby contains the information of life. Obviously, we'll spend quite a bit of time later on the, in this uh, semester going over how DNA, uh, how that information in DNA can be manifested into proteins. And finally, we wrapped up today's lecture talking about the Avery experiment, which conclusively proved that DNA had to be the heritable material of life by showing that if you took DNA from a virulent bacteria and you transferred that DNA into an avirulent bacteria, you converted or transformed that second bacteria into being virulent. That meant DNA had to be able to contain information, DNA had to be a self-contained information containing molecule, and that by definition was the heterable material of life. So that's it for this lecture. We'll go over some of these concepts in class, and um, I, uh, that's it.